Most people assume that world-class mathematicians come from predictable places. Elite schools, stable systems, countries designed to produce them. But what if that assumption is wrong? What if some of the most influential figures in modern mathematics didn't rise because the system worked, but because they managed to pass through systems that were never built for them in the first place? This is the story of Arlie Peters, not as a tale of genius in isolation, but as an experiment in access. Born in a small country with limited educational infrastructure, Peters began life far outside the pipelines that typically lead to Harvard, Princeton, or the upper ranks of American academia. Statistically speaking, the probability of that trajectory was close to zero. And yet, it happened. But here is the more interesting question. Was his success an outlier? Or proof that talent is far more evenly distributed than opportunity? Because when Peters eventually entered elite institutions, he didn't just study mathematics. He studied how institutions work, who they reward, who they exclude, and what happens when someone who understands both sides is given the power to lead. This isn't just a biography. It's a test case. A test of what happens when global inequality collides with elite education and something rare makes it through. Before elite universities ever entered the picture, Arlie Peters grew up in Belize, a small nation with limited access to advanced mathematics education and few direct pathways into global research institutions. This matters because where you're born still strongly predicts what kind of knowledge systems you'll ever encounter. Peters came from economically disadvantaged circumstances in a part of the world where intellectual potential is common, but institutional access is not. In much of the global South, the question isn't whether talent exists. It's whether there's a bridge between that talent and the places where it can be developed. For students like Peters, the distance between curiosity and opportunity isn't measured in grades. It's measured in geography, resources, and visibility. Eventually, that distance narrowed. Through academic merit, Petras migrated to the United States, entering an educational system that functions less like an open marketplace of ideas and more like a series of tightly controlled gates. Admission, funding, mentorship, each step filtered by institutions designed to identify a very specific kind of student, and most never make it through. This is where the story often gets simplified into individual brilliance, but that misses the real mechanism at work. Because what allowed Peters to advance wasn't just intelligence, it was access. Access to schooling that could recognize his ability, access to mentors who could guide him, and access to institutions willing to open their doors, even briefly. This act isn't about celebrating rare success. It's about understanding how rare the opportunity itself was. In a global system where millions of capable minds never encounter elite academic pathways at all, reaching the gateway is already an extraordinary event. Once inside the gates, the system does something very specific. It doesn't just teach you more, it reshapes how you think. For Arlie Peters, that transformation began at Harvard University. Here, mathematics wasn't just treated as a collection of answers, but as a living language, one used to model uncertainty, 
structure complexity, and test the limits of what can be known. This is where students stop being consumers of knowledge and start being trained as future producers of it. But Harvard was only the beginning. At Princeton University, Petras entered one of the most intense mathematical environments in the world, a place where proving something new matters more than mastering what's already known, where your value isn't measured by exams, but by whether you can contribute to the discipline itself. This is where the shift happens. Petras specialized in probability theory, random matrix theory, and mathematical finance, fields that sit at the intersection of abstraction and reality. These aren't just theoretical pursuits. They're tools used to understand markets, risk, and complex systems where uncertainty is the defining feature. And that choice matters, because elite institutions don't just refine technical skill, they shape intellectual identity. They influence which problems are considered important, which methods are seen as legitimate, and which applications are valued. Over time, students don't just learn mathematics. They learn how mathematicians are expected to think, speak, and contribute. By the time Petras earned his PhD, he wasn't simply someone who was good at math. He had been credentialed, validated, and absorbed into the highest academic system in the field. This isn't about individual genius. It's about how elite institutions take raw potential, wherever it comes from, and convert it into recognized authority within the global knowledge economy. Up to now, Arlie Peters had existed inside institutions largely on their terms, admitted, trained, credentialed. But faculty life changes the equation. At Duke University, Peters entered a different layer of academia, one where influence is no longer measured by grades or dissertations, but by what structures you leave behind because universities don't just run on ideas, they run on programs. In the late 20th and early 21st century, higher education was undergoing a structural shift. Fields that once lived at the margins, applied mathematics, quantitative finance, risk modeling, were moving towards the center. Not because they were more elegant, but because they were more useful. Markets were becoming mathematically complex. Financial systems were increasingly driven by models, probabilities, and assumptions about uncertainty. And universities noticed. Petrus' research sat exactly at that intersection, where abstract mathematics meets real-world systems. His work in probability theory and random matrix theory wasn't just mathematically rigorous. It was institutionally valuable. So instead of staying within a traditional departmental lane, Peters did something far more consequential. He built infrastructure. The Duke Mathematical Finance Program wasn't simply an academic offering. It was a strategic decision about what kind of mathematics deserved to be taught, funded, and scaled. This is what program building really means. It means deciding which students will be trained for emerging industries, which mathematical tools will move from theory into practice, and which academic pathways will exist 10 or 20 years into the future. By founding the program, Peters helped redefine mathematics as institutional capital, a resource universities could deploy in finance, economics, and beyond. This is a subtle kind of power. Because once a program exists, it outlives the person who created it. It shapes cohorts of students, it attracts funding, it alters higher decisions, it changes what the university is. 
In this act, Petrus is no longer just someone shaped by elite institutions. He becomes someone who reshapes them from the inside. And that shift, from participant to system builder, is what makes the next stage of his career inevitable. By the time Arlie Peters moved into senior leadership, his role within academia had fundamentally changed. This was no longer about equations, programs, or even departments. This was about governance. As Dean of Trinity College of Arts and Sciences at Duke University, Peters entered the layer of academia where decisions stopped being abstract where budgets, hiring, curriculum, and institutional priorities determine whose knowledge counts and whose futures are possible. Because leadership in a university isn't symbolic, it's structural. Deans and provosts decide which disciplines grow, which voices are recruited, and which students are supported. They shape the environment long before any classroom interaction ever happens. Later, as provost at the University of Miami, Peters took on even broader influence. The provost's office is where academic vision becomes institutional reality, where strategy turns into policy and policy reshapes lives at scale. And this is where his biography matters most. Peters had not entered academia through inherited privilege or predictable pipelines. He understood personally and professionally, how exclusion operates quietly through access points that most people never see. That perspective shaped his public advocacy. He has consistently spoken about diversity in STEM, educational access and institutional inclusion, not as moral abstractions, but as design problems, problems that require structural solutions not symbolic gestures. Because diversity, at the institutional level, isn't about representation alone. It's about governance. It's about who gets hired, who gets funded, who gets mentored, and which pathways are made visible or invisible. In this final act, Peters is no longer framed as an exception who beat the odds. He becomes evidence evidence that institutions can evolve when leadership understands exclusion not as a theory but as lived experience when reform isn't performative but embedded in policy programs and people this is how academic change actually happens quietly structurally and long after the individual has moved on